Hello everybody, and welcome back to Lesser Known History. Today, we will be talking more about the Renaissance, specifically the time period dubbed the High Renaissance. Let's hop right into it. So what was the High Renaissance? Well, it was a time frame for about 35 years between the years 1490 and 1525. It was concentrated in Florence and Rome, and from those epicenters would spread out amongst the Italian peninsula. Patronage for the movement came from wealthy merchant families and the papacy. These aforementioned wealthy merchant families, a topic we discussed in the last episode of this series, were able to get their societal mobility because of the vacancy that the Black Death led to amongst the nobility. The most important part of the Renaissance was the High Renaissance. Popes Julius II and Leo X helped to spur it along. We'll discuss them here in a moment. Every part of the arts and humanities flourished. It occurred in Italy and would directly lead to the spreading of the Renaissance following its collapse, which we will talk about here in a little bit. Important people to think about are da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael. Let's talk about the popes. Pope Julius II, commissioned for a new St. Peter's Basilica, commissioned himself a tomb adorned with Michelangelo's sculptures, and commissioned the Sistine Chapel and Raphael rooms in this new basilica. So the new St. Peter's Basilica is still around today, and you can visit it if you visit the Vatican. Let's talk about Leo X. He was a Medici. Remember last episode when I talked about them? Well, yes, they were even able to make their way into the papacy. He accelerated the construction of the new St. Peter's Basilica, and his actions directly led to the end of the High Renaissance. Now, I understand this is very brief, and I may in the future talk more about Pope Julius II or Leo X in their own episodes, but for now, the reason this is so short is so that way we can get the context for what the artists that we are going to talk about did. Raphael. He was born in Urbino, Italy in 1483. His father was a painter, and he apprenticed under Pietro Perugino until 1500 when he became a master. So look at that. He became a master between the ages of 16 and 17. He moved around Italy and painted in different towns until he was commissioned by Pope Julius II to paint frescoes in the new St. Peter's Basilica, painted in what would become the Pope's private library. And unlike some of the other artists that we'll talk about, he used teams and assistants to help him. So when we talk about the individual genius in the Renaissance, it's really important to discuss its different aspects when we talk about Raphael. When we get into Michelangelo and da Vinci, they did their stuff on their own. But Raphael was interesting because he was a painting master. He could do it all himself, but he employed teams to help him. So the artistic genius in this way would apply to him because he was the one that was able to direct them and draw it out for them to paint. I mean, he did some of it himself, but that's the most important part to discuss. He painted four rooms in St. Peter's Basilica that are now all called the Stanza della Segnatura. Here are some of Raphael's most famous works, the Sistine Madonna and the School of Athens. The second artist we are going to talk about is Michelangelo. He was born in 1475 in Florence, Italy. He was a painter, sculptor, and architect. He became the most documented artist of all time because he was alive and working when Giorgio Vasari wrote The Lives of the Artists, which was the first biographical writing about the artists and their work. He became very good friends with Lorenzo de' Medici, created loads of artwork for the papacy, becoming one of their most prolific artists that they employed. He created a massive statue of David, which I'm pretty sure we have all seen, and that is really what, I guess, blew him up and put him on the map. He was also commissioned to create the tomb of Pope Julius II. He was able to make three sculptures for it, the dying slave, the bound slave, and Moses, before Pope Julius II decommissioned him from that. But he then said, hey, Michelangelo, how about you come work for us again and paint the Sistine Chapel, which is his best known work. He also wrote some poetry, and he served the papacy until his death. Here are some of his most famous artworks. Down on the left, you can see the tomb of Pope Julius II, incorporating some of the statues that he made. And on the right, the Sistine Chapel, which is, in my opinion, the greatest work of art in history. It is a gorgeous piece of artwork that I still cannot believe that the papacy picks popes sitting under that. Also, that's good alliteration. Let us talk about the true Renaissance man himself, 
Leonardo da Vinci. He was born in 1452 in Florence, Italy. He was a painter, draftsman, sculptor, architect, poet, writer, engineer, and he was the true Renaissance man. Our idea of what a Renaissance man is, is directly because Leonardo da Vinci was so incredibly motivated at what he did. He directly led and influenced humanist thought through teachings. He accepted an invitation from King Francis I of France to become his personal artist, and that is how he left Italy. Once he left Italy, he just left Italy for life. His diagrams and drawings inspired modern-day inventions. We've all heard about the tank or the flying aircraft, all those different things Leonardo da Vinci did. There's a really cool story how he created a diagram for a canal that would connect, I forget which city, but it was an Italian city to the ocean, and he never got the funding for it. Well, in the modern times, when people did build the canal, by pure coincidence, they ended up doing um, their canal work in the exact area and in the exact ways that Leonardo da Vinci had written down. And they did not figure that out until well afterwards, when they rediscovered it. Here are his two most famous works. The Last Supper and the Mona Lisa. Now, I want to touch on two things real quick. The Mona Lisa is so very important because of the technique it used. It was a technique called, depending on how you want to pronounce it, sfumato or fumato, which means smoke in Italian. And pay close attention to how the Mona Lisa is created. It's very smoky and all the lines almost blend together, right? It looks almost as if it's smoky around her in a haze. And that was the first time it was ever used and ever since it's been incorporated by different kinds of artists. I also want to talk about one more thing that was an honorable mention that did not make this picture that you all are looking at now, but I think is very important. It is the Vitruvian Man. We've all seen it. It's the man with, you know, those four arms. Well, here's why it's important. Because up until that point, they had not found a way, I mean, they, I mean mathematicians or writers had not been able to figure out a way to draw the quote-unquote proportional human in both a circle and a square. And that is how you find it today. All right, everybody, let's talk about the end of the High Renaissance. So, if there is one thing we all know, that is that up until recently, the French and the Germans did not get along at all. And another thing is that Europe always is ready for a good fight. So, remember our good old friend Pope Leo? Yeah, so at the end of Leo's papal reign, he had started to get the church involved with European affairs. Now, what I mean by that is he was kind of going in and making alliances. It wasn't that big of a deal, you know. The popes before had done that. But, I mean, they were the ones who helped to crown leaders before, so it's not unheard of. But trouble was brewing. You see, Charles V the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, had now also become King Charles of Spain. And King Francis I of France was not having this. So, they go to war. Now, this is a very long war, as we all know. And Charles does the exact thing that you would expect him to do. He takes his army and marches on Rome. However, when he gets to the city, he orders his troops not to ransack the city, not to go in. However, let's talk a little bit about what the army's composition was. It composed of three main groups. Spanish Catholics, German Catholics, and German Protestants. Now, we know that the Protestants and the Catholics did not get along well. So, against his wishes, the Protestants in the army burned and destroyed Renaissance artworks and looted the city. However, it wasn't just them that did all the destruction, don't you worry. Some of the Catholics in Spain, they just wanted loot. So then they also helped out and just destroyed the city. It depopulated the vast majority of the city itself. Pope Clement was able to run to a citadel, but many of the papal forces, including much of the Swiss Guard, was killed in the fighting. Clement VII was so humiliated by this 
and he was forced to hand over large swaths of gold and territory to the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, a little bit about Pope Clement VII. He is also a Medici. He drained many funds from the papacy, and because of the attack on Rome and its destruction, the Renaissance would begin to shift outwards. Now, its ideas had already begun to spread, but the most important parts of the Renaissance outside of Italy is just about to begin. These ideas were beginning to spread across the Alps into France and into Germany, and that will be where we continue this series. I hope you all enjoyed this episode of Lesser Known History and our continuing study of the Renaissance. If you enjoyed, hit that like button and subscribe, and I want to thank you all so much for watching. Have a great day.